morning as we observe the second Sunday after Trinity. We'll begin our worship this morning with hymn number 902.
my support in the day of my calamity. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. The Lord was my support in the day of my calamity. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me.
Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. The epistle lesson is recorded in the book, in the letter to Ephesians, chapter 2, beginning at the 13th verse. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us rise. Alleluia. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Alleluia. Confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. 
God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have sent your Son to invite us to your banquet. We ask that you would strengthen our faith so that we never despise or reject this invitation. But feed us with your word and with the body and blood of your dear Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Dear fellow invitees to the banquet of our Lord, have you ever received an invitation to a party? Or have you ever not received an invitation to a certain party? Suppose it happened that someone in the community, someone famous and wealthy, were throwing an elegant party. It would be spectacular. It would feature a three-course dinner catered by the finest restaurant, and guests would be entertained during the meal by a highly amusing comedy routine, and the whole evening would end with a dance to the music of a live band. Now, rumors have been circulating, and it sounds like everyone who's anyone in the community will be invited to this, to this banquet. And that's not surprising. The banquet hall seats thousands, and the host certainly is wealthy enough to treat far more than that. And one day you receive a call from a friend, and she's very excited. She informs you she's received her invitation in the mail, wonders if you've gotten yours yet. So grinning, you run outside to check completely forgetting about your friend on the other end of the phone, which you just haphazardly dropped onto the carpet. You grab the mailbox to break your momentum, and you reach inside and retrieve three envelopes. The first one's a bill, it looks like. second one's an advertisement. It must be the third one. But you let out a disappointed sigh because it's not there. You have not received an invitation. So you walk back to the front door slowly, in your distress for getting to close the mailbox. Why isn't your invitation here yet? Well, as you think about it, you realize that you're, you're being silly. It must be coming tomorrow. It's probably still at the post office. It's probably on the way. But it doesn't come tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day, and you realize you're just going to have to face the reality that you are not invited. You have been excluded. Now, suppose that friend who called you later informs you she's not even attending the party. She's been asked to work that evening, and she needs to do what she can to impress her boss if she wants to get that big promotion. And you think, well, that's just unbelievable. You see her next door neighbor out mowing his lawn, and you step outside and mention to him that she's missing the big banquet just for a couple extra hours of work, and he's not even surprised. He's not going either. He never even considered attending, but threw his invitation away the day it arrived, because he never misses poker night with his buddies. And you wonder, how can these people take their invitations for granted? How can they allow themselves to miss out on such a significant event for such silly reasons? You would give anything to have one of their invitations, but these friends of yours just have failed to realize the value of that invitation. Well, today, returning to reality, Jesus invites you to a party. And in fact, it's a far better party than the one I've described. And many before you have, in fact, refused that invitation. So today we consider, first of all, whether or not Jesus' banquet will fit into your schedule. But then also today we remember that Jesus, for our sakes, has made that banquet fit into his schedule. Jesus told this parable, the parable of a banquet, in the home of a Pharisee during an actual meal. It was perhaps nothing fancy like the banquet Jesus describes. We read in Luke's Gospel, they had just gathered to eat bread on the Sabbath. During the meal, Jesus had healed a man of a disease called dropsy. And of course, the Pharisees would have considered that to be work on the Sabbath, an infraction of the third commandment. However, Jesus had pointed out to them that any one of them would have rescued one of his animals from a pit on the Sabbath. Then noticing those present claiming the most honorable seats for themselves, Jesus had given them a lesson on humility when he said, whoever exalts himself 
will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so it was in this setting that Jesus told the parable before us today. Certainly the lack of humility that Jesus observed in those around him reminded him that these Pharisees had rejected him. And so in the parable, Jesus describes his own incarnation. Yes, God the Father had prepared a great feast, an eternal feast, in fact. He would send his Son into the world to save fallen mankind so that all believers could have salvation. The servant he sent was Jesus, and the supper was at hand. Jesus, the Passover lamb, was soon to be sacrificed. His holy flesh would be the feast. And Jesus had become a human. He had come into the world for the purpose of saving all people, including the Pharisees gathered at that meal. And he had extended the invitation to the Israelites. He had invited them to the feast that the Father had prepared. However, like those men invited in the parable, the Pharisees were busy with other matters. They had no time for Jesus and his feast. Now, outwardly, the Pharisees were good people. They were the most religious, best-behaved people around. They followed a strict set of rules, even beyond the commands of God. Their practices of tithing, fasting, etc. were second to none. And nothing was wrong with these practices in themselves. In fact, we probably could learn a thing or two from the Pharisees about piety, about faithfulness to God's commands. However, the Pharisees were mistaken because they believed that they could make themselves right before God by these strict rules, by following these rules, by these practices of theirs. They believed if they strictly kept every command of God and then some, they could earn salvation for themselves. And therefore they saw no need for this traveling <coughs> preacher from Nazareth named Jesus. What good could his message do to them? What could he offer them? They already had the law of God and were quite adept at keeping it. Or so they thought. Unfortunately for the Pharisees, they failed to understand the law. Jesus taught quite clearly that God was not concerned only about outward actions, but also about the attitude of the heart. A man may never have committed adultery, Jesus says, and yet everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. They all certainly... <clears throat> The Pharisees should, in fact, have known that God was concerned about the condition of the heart. They should have realized it. They all certainly had read in their scriptures the words of 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So yes, the Pharisees were quite capable of living their lives according to a certain set of rules. However, even they remained unable to overcome the sinful condition that still remained in their hearts. They were wicked sinners like everyone else. And in fact, righteous as they seemed, their sinful pride even became quite evident in their words and actions. Jesus knew all too well that these Pharisees needed an invitation to the banquet of his father. He knew they needed the salvation that he had come to offer them. Their rejection of his salvation was tragic, and certainly it troubled Jesus deeply. So Jesus faithfully had carried out the mission with which the Father had entrusted him. He had invited Israel to the feast, but the Pharisees and Israel in general had not had the time to attend the banquet. Now what would Jesus do? Well, the parable tells us. He would go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. These would have been the social outcasts of the day. We can understand the situation of the poor. They could not afford the 
clothing and food that they needed to survive. They simply did not have money. But unlike today, it was also the crippled and blind and lame who were very hard pressed to fit into society. Special ramps and elevators and wheelchairs were not available for the crippled and lame. Dogs were not trained to guide the blind. All of these people would have been unable to work. They would have been social outcasts and beggars, living at the mercy of the generosity of all those who passed by. As we read the pages of the Gospel accounts, we see that Jesus healed many disabled people during his ministry, lame and blind and so on. And unlike a majority of the Israelites, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, were in fact able to see who Jesus was through the eyes of faith. These people put their trust in him. They attended the banquet that God had prepared, and they will enjoy that banquet forever. We see in the parable that the banquet was not yet full. We read, the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. And so Jesus obeyed this command as well. He went to the Gentiles with his saving gospel message. In fact, we might say the highways and hedges include us today. We also are Gentiles whom Jesus has invited to the banquet of the Father. And so we might ask ourselves, will this banquet fit into my schedule? Unfortunately, the attitude of the Pharisees remains quite common in the world even now. Because this idea that we are able to earn our way to heaven is attractive to us by nature. In fact, look at any religion in the world besides pure Christianity and you'll probably find in some form this work righteous teaching. Earn your way. Lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Follow these rules and you'll be okay. Even many today who call themselves Christians believe that they are able to earn their way to heaven or at least to help out on some level. And so ultimately they see no need for Jesus. They casually, casually reject him. They're too busy focusing on their own efforts. Other people today, many other people, simply have no time for spiritual matters at all. Just like those mentioned in the parable. They're busy marrying, raising families, earning income, and faithfully carrying out their various vocations in life. All of these things are good. God-pleasing activities. However... It's a matter of priority. We always must make our spiritual needs the top priority in life. Some people who have no time for Jesus right now might say they plan on focusing more on spiritual matters at a later time. Once they've reached a certain age or a certain goal in life. And yet this is foolish. For one thing, none of us knows when this life will end. Jesus once told another parable of a man who built large barns in which he planned to store all his crops. And then he thought that because of his great success, he would have an easy life ahead of him. He could relax and enjoy life. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So what about us? Have you found yourselves in any of these categories. Have you ever felt that maybe your sins aren't all that bad? At least not as bad as that other person you know. Or have you thought that you've done so many good things and must outweigh the few bad things, the few mistakes you've made? Certainly God will be pleased with your life if you've done enough good, you think. Or, or maybe you're thinking, no, I've never thought any of those things. None of these attitudes describes me. Well, then let me ask this. Have you always put God first in your life? Have you always valued your family Bible studies and times of worship with fellow believers above all other activities? Even if you're in church every single week, is it always because you want to be here, you look forward to it as the highlight of your week? To hear the word of God, 
Or are there sometimes other motivations mixed in? Maybe you're here because you have to be. You feel an obligation. Others will look down on you if you're not present. Or it's just your routine and you really have nothing else to do on a Sunday morning. So why not go? If you're like me, several of these attitudes have described you at various times in life. God has blessed us more richly than we realize with his means of grace. But do we truly recognize how great these blessings are? Have we truly made the time in our schedules, the place in our lives, that the gracious Lord of the universe deserves? If we look at our lives carefully, we will see we have not always found the time in our schedules for the banquet of God. However, we see something else in Scripture as well. We see that Jesus has adjusted His schedule to bring this banquet to us. Now, Jesus could have found something more pleasant to do than bring us this banquet. He's true God. He could do anything He wants. And yet, willingly, He chose to set aside His divine power and to take on human flesh. And he lived like us in this fallen world. However, unlike us, he lived a perfect life. Unlike the Pharisees who kept the law only outwardly, only in appearance, Jesus obeyed the entire law also, also inwardly with the heart. He never committed a sin by his actions. He never even thought one sinful thought. And he lived this life for us cover up all the times that we have rejected him by our sinful thoughts, words, and actions. And in all of this, Jesus, Jesus also went on to pay the price of our, of our rejection. He was rejected by God in his suffering and death so that we never have to experience the rejection of God that we deserve. And it is because of what Christ has done for us that God gladly invites us to his banquet as his holy children. God invites us to celebrate with him the salvation that he has won for us. Just think what a wonderful banquet God has provided for us. Even here on earth, in this life, in the midst of all of our troubles and sorrows and hardships, even here on earth, we gather with fellow believers to sing the praises of God, joining with the very angels of heaven. God himself is present among us to serve us with his holy word and sacraments. Our souls enjoy the opportunity to taste the word of God, to drink the forgiving waters of baptism, to consume the very same body and blood that carried all of our sins two millennia ago. What a banquet we have before us. And having tasted this banquet here and now, we await with anticipation the day on which we will feast with God in heaven. And there we will feast in the full glory of God, and it will last forever. All of this is possible because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, whom God sent to invite each one of us to his banquet. And you need not come to the banquet alone. The banquet hall still is not yet full. God would love to see you bring friends or relatives to this banquet. And you can do that, perhaps simply by telling them, what Christ has done for you and for them. By inviting them to come to church, to join you in a, in a Bible study. If they're unchurched, you could encourage them to join and remain active in a church that correctly teaches the Word of God. When we have opportunities to lead others to the Word and the sacraments, we are giving them the chance to receive the salvation of Christ as the Holy Spirit works on their hearts. Through the faith that these needs of grace create and strengthen, we know that we will enjoy the banquet of our Lord forever. So think again about that party I mentioned earlier, the one your friend and neighbor, without a second thought, decided to blow off. A few days before the event, your invitation finally comes in the mail. You of all people understand now how foolish it would be to pass up such an opportunity so will you attend the party? Or returning to reality, will you attend the great banquet that God has prepared for you? S certainly you could find many, many other things to do in, 
instead, however, Jesus has set aside everything else to make this banquet work out for you. He offers you admission to the banquet completely free of charge. How could anyone pass up this opportunity? Come, for everything is now ready. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We sing hymn number 683.
our church in uh, Corpus Christi, uh, Texas, but he's uh, resigned his call for personal reasons. So we'll simply pray for him and his family that the Lord bless them as well as bless the congregation as they move forward, uh, presumably with uh, the calling process. But let, it, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we bless you for your inspired word, written through the prophets and apostles. For by that word you have revealed your grace, and as you have given us great and precious promises. We beseech you to bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, that we may grow in the knowledge of our Savior, and ever be comforted by your faithfulness in the fulfillment of your word. We especially thank and praise you for your love in bringing us from death unto life by the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our place, and by the power of his resurrection. Give us, O Father, the spirit of your love, so that, loving you above all things, we may also show your love by what we say and do unto others. Wherever we find people in want or need, give us hearts of compassion, so that we are eager to share the blessings that you have given us. And grant, dear Lord, that those to whom we show compassion may be moved to glorify you. We thank you, dear Father, that by the merits and mercies of Christ our Lord, we have been healed of the disease of sin, and that through the proclamation of this gospel, you have invited all people to come and likewise be healed. We pray that we may join your whole church on earth in bringing this invitation to all nations, and that many may respond with ready and willing hearts. Send your messengers forth to confront the world with its sin and to invite troubled sinners to perfect cleansing by the blood of your Son, Jesus. Grant that all to whom your word is preached may respond with hearts of faith, casting aside all self-righteousness and trusting only in Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with earthly fathers. We pray that you be with all the fathers among us and bless them as they continue to carry out their calling uh, to, to serve the children that you have entrusted into their care. Forgive all fathers for their failures and, and their, their, their sinful inability to, to serve you faithfully as earthly fathers, but grant each father through your word strength and courage to continue serving and especially raising the children under their care in the truths of your word. We pray that you create in each of us a, a true thankfulness for the blessings you have provided to us through earthly fathers, especially the blessing of, of having been brought up in the truth of your word. We also pray today on behalf of Sam Nauman and his family, we pray that you would be with them, guide them, and bless them as they move forward in life, and also bless the congregation, resurrection, and Corpus Christi as they seek a new pastor according to your gracious will. Lord, of, Lord God of hosts, rule over our nation and give your guidance to all who are in authority. Bless our homes so that they may be schools of true wisdom and harbors of true love and that all who dwell there may find peace and joy in harmony with you and with one another. We ask your special guidance, protection, and comfort for the sick and the sorrowful, the aged and the lonely. Tenderly bestow upon them your mercy and show them what great things you have prepared for your children. Hear our prayer, O Father, and if there may be anything else we should have asked, grant it according to your abundant mercy. And for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We continue on page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <coughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy. 